I'd like to introduce our next panel on uh, corporate startup innovation. And I'd like to invite uh, Abby Thomas on stage, please, Editor-in-Chief of Entrepreneur Middle East. Hey everyone, uh, so my job has been made a little easier thanks to PK's uh, expert uh, moderation of the previous panel because we are to going to be talking about corporates and how they involve themselves in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, without any further ado, uh, let me call on stage uh, Mr. Malik Hamoud, who is the Group Executive Director at Zain Kuwait. And I would also like to welcome Dr. Susan Ahmad, who is the Founder and CEO of Venture High. To the best, it's exactly. Really nice, Especially after the previous uh, session, which yes. was uh, we had to a very good that. start up. We had to have a discussion. little bit of a break. Okay, um, so just to give a bit of a background about what we're talking about uh, is how corporates are involving themselves in the uh, ecosystem space. And one of the best uh, stats that I got from ArabNet Business Intelligence is that uh, over the past four years, we have had more than 25 uh, Middle Eastern companies investing in new ventures as part of their uh, entry into this space. Um, I mean, they, they've been doing this in different ways. It's by, you know, launching funds or accelerators. They have been having their own uh, fostering innovation spaces. And we're seeing more and more of that happening. And uh, one of the companies that has been doing a lot in this space has indeed been Zane. Uh, and uh, we have the right person here on stage to ask uh, about his approach towards this particular strategy. So um, just to start things off, Maral, like, can you talk about like, how did this start about in Zane and why did you get into uh, corporate startup innovation in the first place? Thank you, Abby. Thank you for having us uh, here today. So basically at Zane, it's, um, this journey started uh, five years ago. And uh, you, can call it, you can say it's part of our DNA we, we have a young spirit, uh, and uh, a nice statement was, was mentioned this morning by one of the guest speakers, and coming from a bank, it's, it's quite interesting, uh, that innovation always comes from the top, and you need to groom, basically, the spirit of, of a corporation. Mm -hmm. So what we've done at Zen is, is, is start as an experiment uh, five years ago. Uh, so, for example, let me give you an example of what we've done in Kuwait. So four years ago, we launched a program called uh, Zen Great Idea, or called ZGI, and thank you for being uh, part of the panel yeah, today. I had a part, today. yeah. <laughs> uh, so ZGI is in its fourth edition now. Uh, ZGI is, 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 uh, is an accelerator model that we have created for uh, Kuwaiti entrepreneurs. Uh, of course, the first, the first version was kind of learning from, from the process, and now we have a much more advanced process. Uh, so we receive hundreds of applications. We go through a, a diligent process of, of, select of selecting the best ones. Then we take the best 10 out of the hundreds of applications received, we take them through a three to six month program. Uh, we associate ourselves with Brilliant Labs and other partners in, in, in the region and the world. And then we let them go, we introduce them to the VC world. In some cases, we look at them as part of the portfolio where we could have some direct investments. And it's basically opening up doors for the, 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 where the money is. Mm -hmm. So that's in Kuwait uh, when it comes to the ecosystem in Kuwait. A new initiative that was launched uh, earlier this year by our group CEO, who's, who's very vocal about it and is very pushy about doing investments in this arena, uh, is a program we call Zaniac. And this program is similar to ZGI, but mm -hmm. it's only for, it's, we call it the internal innovation program. So it's for our employees across eight countries. Uh, and uh, we have received already hundreds of applications. We're having a full pitch day uh, at the end of November. And this is part of uh, nurturing the spirit of, of entrepreneurs and the energy that we need to have within a company. Mm -hmm. We're a tech company at the day. So if we don't have it within us, it can be very difficult to transform and, and face the challenges that are coming ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, in the region, we've also worked closely with uh, the MIT Pan-Arab uh, Forum. And that was an amazing experience for us, to be honest. We've been doing this for three years, mm -hmm. and we're waiting for the application now in December for the next round. For the round. next competition, And yeah. that basically gave us exposure to the whole region. Uh, you see entrepreneurs from all the way from Morocco all the way to, to Yemen. Uh, 
amazing ideas uh, and it, it gave us lots of exposure and, and, and uh, thought process on how to evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, lastly, we have a program that was also started, uh, that started two, three years ago called the Zen Innovation Center. The first one was in Jordan, Jordan. Man, called Zinc. Uh, big success, to be honest. And uh, it, it kind of groomed the spirit of corporate venture capital in, in Jordan and in some part of the, of the region. Uh, recently, we have also launched in Lebanon as part of Touch Labs uh, in coordination with ArabNet. So ArabNet is very familiar with this process, uh, a similar concept. And we're planning to, go, to grow that into other countries like Kuwait, uh, Saudi, Iraq, hopefully, mm -hmm. when things stabilize. And Sudan is, is, is an amazing market. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've done uh, around the ecosystem in general. Uh, for, for you as a, as, a, as a company though, like when you say about these ventures, what's the driving force? What's the, the goal that you're trying to realize when you uh, step into these spaces from your perspective? Well, many goals. And uh, so the first goal for, uh, for is definitely is uh, trying to transfer that, the, the knowledge that we have and uh, the know-how that we have to, to these uh, young entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we sit down, because who sits down? Who, who's part of the accelerator or the incubator? It's, it's our employees, mm -hmm. people who have years and years of experience. So we're trying really to, to create a culture, an ecosystem that, that's promoting and pushing for, for entrepreneurs to, to go and run. And we all know how difficult it is for an entrepreneur or a startup mm -hmm. uh, to build a business. And we had the Just Clean example earlier today yeah, yeah. that these guys had to go. And we've seen many, many examples. You have to do everything by your hand. You become the salesman, the marketing manager, the, the, the financial guy. You become everything. Mm -hmm. So it's part of, of the whole. And uh, for example, one issue that we always uh, struggle with in this region is the legal framework. There's no legal framework. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very poorly structured. You have to fight for a license. You have to fight for uh, for getting. There's a lot of bureaucracy. It's, it's, yeah. it's quite difficult. Yeah. So we try to help as much as possible. And it's part of uh, again, we go back to the DNA, the culture issue that we want to basically push for people to do that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Susan, I want to bring you into the discussion. Now, in the Middle East, this is still kind of like a new space, but again, given your background, you've seen this a lot. Actually, uh, for the people in the room who don't know what VentureDrive is, can you give an introduction and explain your work in this space as well? Sure. Yeah. So, five years ago now, we started very simply focused on high growth technology startups and had great success. And at the time, I was a consultant for the World Bank and the State Department and the Kauffman Foundation, building out uh, evaluation tools to determine ROI on all of these programs. Some of these centers, some of these universities, some of these countries were spending tens or hundreds of millions of dollars yearly on programs, very, very few metrics, and no clarity on the data of the impact of what was happening. As our startups kept growing, I started to see over and over again, they would go in to try to sell to corporates and the corporates were not prepared to actually do a proper due diligence with them, to integrate with them. Even if they were available to make an investment, it just was not going to be the kind of support that the startup actually wanted from the corporation, mm -hmm. where they wanted to access distribution and really create the economies of scope and scale that the corporate could have if their bureaucracy wasn't always getting in the way. Mm -hmm. So what we started doing is some really fun things. First with Microsoft, we started training Microsoft employees all over the world, first in four countries, how to run accelerators at scale. And most importantly, not just having a physical place, but connecting these companies all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and to each other and coordinating the resources across Microsoft properly. We then went on to do accelerator programs with the U.S. Veterans Administration, the State Department, um, and we got better and better at it, focusing in fintech, healthcare, FIS Global, which is the world's largest fintech company. They use our platform, and we built all of their content and trained their people for running proper accelerators. But again, the problem kept happening in that the there were amazing employees within these corporations who had similar ideas to what the startups were doing. And the conflicts of interest were not being controlled for, very little documentation across people who were mentoring from the organization with startups, and then that information coming back into the organization. So we started to build out a software solution that we now license all over the world. And for a company like Walmart, we were able to 
create an entrepreneurship program internally for their CIO. So you, they have 6,000 people in Walmart tech. We were able to build out a program internally for their employees mm. and at the same time build their entire innovation diligence process, which can be used for internal as well as external and actually train their employees how to mentor properly so that there's full documentation. Because you only need one time of a startup from the outside feeling like their idea was stolen because the corporation who may have been working on that project for two years mm -hmm. feels as though they heard it from a startup and the startup feels like it was stolen. So basically, we make everything in the innovation space as nerdy as possible with documentation and data and metrics. And therefore, you have true portfolio management you're really helping the startups be prepared to go into a corporate setting or add value in whatever way. And most importantly, you're creating the kind of culture and values within a corporation so that they can be agile, whether they're going to disrupt from within or bring a startup externally, externally. in to be able to actually integrate properly, right. which is still a challenge everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. That, that, that brings me... Uh, specifically to the Middle East. Yes. You've been working in the region for a while. Take us through what you have been seeing with respect to such strategies. What are they doing right? And perhaps more importantly, what are they doing wrong? Well, it's not just for the Middle East. Yeah. It's really everywhere. everywhere. It's yep. Corporates do a lot of wonderful work with startups. But I would say the number one challenge is when they're focused on ecosystem development instead of just saying, here's the ROI for our company, mm -hmm. at some point, Somebody's going to say, what's the actual ROI that this is bringing back to us? Especially mm -hmm. when there isn't a venture fund where there is some type of portfolio yeah, management. Yeah. So it really comes back to making sure that the goals of any kind of program have clear metrics that are aligned to having the data to show the value add to the company. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's actual growth of new business lines, revenue, efficiencies, yeah. whatever. But sometimes it's making sure that you can recruit new employees who are going to help change the culture and move it forward, mm -hmm. or retaining good employees, or having them know how to add value better. So it's not always as clear as, oh, there's a startup investment and here's the return we're getting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's these HR type of you know, employee engagement, keeping those great Keeping employees, those innovation ideas. But, yeah. but understanding from day one what those metrics need to be, making sure everybody who's involved is aligned to them, and then I think the most important thing that I've seen as a, as a mistake that's really easy to fix, if I'm an employee and I love my company and I have this great idea and then they're bringing in some 24-year-old kid who knows nothing about the business mm -hmm. but just so happens to want to do something similar, for me to have to mentor them, yeah, it's... that's really challenging for a lot of employees. Mm -hmm. So making sure that your internal employees feel loved and get the support they need to develop their ideas with a greater investment of resources than the, as much as you love the startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. you want to keep those employees People who, who care have. because they go from being engaged employees to disengaged employees pretty quickly if yeah. they don't feel valued. Yeah. Uh, Malik, this is now a question for you because she has actually touched upon a point which I wanted to ask as well. How do you measure, uh, you know, the impact of all of these initiatives that you do for the entrepreneurial ecosystem? Like, what is there like a business case, or are you looking for actual business rewards, or uh, like, how do you say, okay, this program has done what it's supposed to do? Well, uh, today uh, we're going through what we call the fourth industrial revolution, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, it's the age of digital disruption. It's a good disruption. We like it, we love it. But it means that big companies, big corporations have to adapt to it. They have to transform internally. They have to change lots of things internally, from culture to systems to HR practices to many, many, many things. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, I'll give you a couple of examples of what we've done to adapt to the changes that are happening and that will take you to why we're doing it. Yeah. Uh, so for example, as part of digital transformation exercise, you have to change, as a telecom operator, you have to change your customer experience journey. So you have to redesign it. You have to change the way the service is offered to customers. So we've been looking around, and we found a, uh, a, a Lebanese, uh, a young Lebanese company, 
a couple of entrepreneurs came up with the idea of opening up a app development uh, house, mm. which evolved eventually to become a solution company, then is now a fintech player in the region, and they've, they've evolved quite a lot, and we're in love with them, to be honest. Uh, and they've designed for us uh, the, the platform that we're looking at when it comes to the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And then we went to the extra layer of doing some fintech. So, for example, they have developed for us a uh, mobile uh, wallet uh, in Iraq and in Jordan to bank the unbanked, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with them also with the government of Bahrain, and now they have created a uh, mobile digital payment platform to connect all the 17 banks in, in, in Bahrain, and they have many, many other projects. So it's really, a, it started with an idea, it evolved into becoming something that's much bigger, and of course the reward, you're asking about the reward, is uh, we are going as a brand, we are adding new services to our platforms, uh, and it's by letting these guys just go, we push them. Uh, one of the beauties about uh, being a large telecom player, so we operate in eight countries, we have close to 48 new customers, is that whenever you deal with an entrepreneur, uh, and I'll, I'll delve a bit into more stuff that we've done later on. Uh, when you deal with, with startups, what they need? They need, yes, they need mentoring, coaching, they need money for sure, but they also need to access a larger network. So how can you take them to the next level? Mm -hmm. So one of the, uh, in the previous session was mentioned that everybody is aiming for the Saudi market because it is the largest market in the region. Yeah. Uh, so being uh, as big as we are, we always have the power to take those, those, uh, those startups to the next level. So whether they start in Jordan or Lebanon or Kuwait or uh, wherever in the region, we can always push them to become bigger and bigger. So it's part of, of what we do. The second example, we've been always keen to do some smart city solution stuff and it's been in the media and we've been talking about it. And the region has been mainly around us, uh, mm -hmm. Dubai. Uh, so we have also invested in a uh, company based in Dubai called NNXN. Uh, and they've done a tremendous job in designing uh, what Smart Dubai is. Uh, most recently, they have uh, uh, won a contract with Zen Kuwait to uh, install smart, meter, uh, smart meters with the MEW here in Kuwait. Here in Kuwait okay. uh, yesterday, there was a big announcement that they are working with the National Digitaliz Digitalization Unit of the Kingdom, uh, to basically to start implementing the smart city model into uh, into uh, the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at the way we operate, it's basically we have the core business, which is still the SIM card and the mobile and that, but we have to reinvent ourselves here. But we, and we have as well to add new elements to the formula uh, that will basically eventually will reap the rewards, whether they grow and become 10 times, 100 times bigger, or we sell them like what the example I've given earlier in the session. Mm -hmm. Do, do you still see it as an experiment? Is it still a learning process? What, what's your... It started as a learning experiment. Today, no, we're much more confident. Uh, we have learned a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it's, 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 it's a journey. Mm -hmm. We've done a lot with, with the VCs, uh, and we can talk about the VCs mm -hmm. later. Okay. And uh, I will go back to the collaboration element that was mentioned between the VCs, and this is something that we do a lot. With other corporates or... With, with the VCs, VCs in the okay. region. Okay, uh, in terms of that respect, like we talked about collaboration between VCs, do you, uh, are you in, like do you see other corporates, other, you know, large companies, like we talked about, we had uh, National Bank of Kuwait's uh, CEO yes. earlier. Yes. Do you see that happening across other industries, other these, you know, large, it huge is, companies? It is, it is and are they yes. doing it right? Again, what's your take on the situation here in Kuwait and perhaps across the region as well? It is evolving. You see it across the whole region, to be honest. And uh, especially for large corporations that are feeling the heat. Mm. So when you are a logistical company and you see people like Carriage or Talabat eating part of your pie, uh, you have to, to move very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, when you are an industrial company, uh, in Saudi and you have lots of stuff coming in. So uh, we are evolving, we're changing, uh, and uh, the big players, the, the large corporations are the ones that are make the, making the effort uh, to learn. And we've seen most recently more and more corporates investing in VCs, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is also one of the ways that we have to, done to learn and to get access to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we don't have the manpower, we don't have the skill set, uh, we don't have the, cult the real culture to go and hunt, uh, look for startups. So mm -hmm. it's always very good to, to work in, uh, very closely with the VCs. Uh, since we're talking about VCs, uh, the way we look at VCs, we invested in four VCs. And it was, it was the beginning of the experiment, basically. Mm -hmm. We selected, 
We, we screened basically the VCs in the region. We invested with two VCs. One of, the, one of them was WAMDA and the other is an EVP. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason we did that was basically to explore what are the available opportunities. Uh, and we're not financial investors here. We are yeah. active investors. And I think one of the uh, discussions that happened is 20 to 30 percent of your invest and the investors of the LPs are more active than the active others. Active than the others. Yeah. And we consider ourselves as, as very active. And the reason we invest in VCs is two things. One, we can target some of these investments, take them to the next level, mm -hmm. provide them our network, our connectivity, our technology, our customer base. Uh, and in some cases, also do some direct investments uh, through, uh, to benefit out of the scale. Uh, so it's basically a learning process. Mm -hmm. Then we, we decide, you know, let's go test the Eastern European markets, the Turkish market, very interesting market. Uh, Technology there is a, bit is, is a bit different than what we have here. Mm -hmm. Here it's always about the consumer, it's about the e-commerce, it's around the consumer. Mm -hmm. And the Eastern European market, we've noticed that uh, it's more around the, the, the B2B platforms, more technology -driven. Different sectors, yeah. Uh, so we, we invested in one of, of those funds and uh, it's been extremely interesting. And we're bringing some of these players to the region also to test uh, the appetite of the region for, for companies from there. And lastly, we, we went into the US market. Mm. Uh, we wanted to get a feel of the US market, so we selected one of the smaller uh, VC funds. Uh, and it opened up, for example, for, for us, the, the Northern Ireland markets. Mm. And uh, in one of the transactions that we've been trying to basically benefit and leverage on the Middle East, Bring it we brought back in one region. of the players to Dubai as a bid. So we basically combined Zayn and XM, that player, with the fund. And mm. it's, it's a very nice puzzle how you can create value. And you start thinking globally. Mm -hmm. So it started with an experiment, but today we think that we have a much stronger model and we're evolving. evolving. Uh, Susan, um, again, given your experience and based on what we heard from Malik right now, uh, I'm hoping there are still corporates in here in the room, but for those corporates who are thinking about like venturing into this space, like venturing into supporting startups, supporting entrepreneurs, fostering innovation, uh, what, how would you, you know, what would your advice be to them in terms of building a program that's a win-win, one, and how do they measure the impact of their activities? I think the first place to start is really defining what the goals are mm. because doing an external focus program is extremely different than doing an internal program. Yeah. Yeah. But they need to be integrated in some way. Mm -hmm. So if it's an external program, I don't think a lot of, I, I haven't seen a lot of corporates really leveraging the full stack of the resources that they can utilize to support startups. Usually they think that mentoring and some investment is enough but when they're able to actually provide strong pilots with a, a contract mm -hmm. versus just let's try a little pilot, let's start this little thing, let's run you through our program, that's the kind of stuff that transforms you. Mm -hmm. Because if, if these startups are able to really test what they're doing with live customers and, and have that sandbox to play in, and understand that this can then go to 50 or 100 mm -hmm. and, and go to scale, that's what really helps them build value and businesses versus continue the startup dream. Mm -hmm. um, on the internal side, the real key, again, is making sure that the program isn't just for who, who puts in a nice application that sounds good. Because what always happens is you have people who are a little bit more polished who can explain really well what yeah, they want to do and then it sounds great. And those turn into idea collection type programs. If you instead transform it into being something that's more substantive so that the call center person, the person who may not have any business background actually gets a little bit of support to be able to fully explain a business case for what that could be, all of a sudden you'll find talent and opportunities throughout the organization that really weren't there before mm -hmm. because instead of looking at your top 10% and seeing what kinds of ideas they have, you're really breaking down the silos of the organization. Right. And that's a constant problem for so many of these corporations. Even in pulling startups in, it's very easy for one group to say yes, but when you have to get approval from retail operations or mm. two or three other segments, if they haven't been engaged through that entire process to make sure that that startup is going to meet all the thresholds for acceptance and hopefully get the approval process down to less than a year, 
before the startup dies, mm -hmm. then it's, it's really a frustrating process. Right. So really streamlining that as much as possible and creating these sandbox type experiments, both for internal and external, that's always going to be the way to have really good success. Right. It's building people. Yeah. Uh, speaking of this, and you mentioned again, you know, define your goals, define your objectives, yes. figure out where it, uh, you know, what you're trying to uh, realize. Um, again, this may be like a biased thing because uh, I'm based in Dubai. I see a lot of corporates doing this. And again, one of the complaints I often get is that many companies are moving into the stream m more so or as a PR stunt, like something that shows that, hey, we are supporting entrepreneurship, hey, we are supporting innovation. Uh, first question for you, Susan, would be, what's the danger of such programs? What, like, can it actually hurt the ecosystem? Can it actually hurt the businesses that become part of these programs? What's your take Definitely. on the situation? We've actually been brought in several times to Fortune 200 companies where they had a big announcement, and they spent a lot of money on an innovation center, and mm -hmm. it's a beautiful building with every possible cool thing you can imagine. Yes. <laughs> and then nothing happens in it. Yeah. And even if they bring startups in, if there isn't something structured that has KPIs to it and, and some substance, it just makes them look very foolish, mm. especially because if it hasn't been organized in a way that's truly benefiting some group, it may be four startups from a region, it may be four startups, and it doesn't have to be 50 startups. No. But if that's not defined really well, and then real value added to them, they'll turn on you really fast. Mm. Startups are notoriously focused on their survival, yeah, they and that's to. it. Yeah. And if you give them value, they'll give you back a lot of value. Mm. But if you're not really going through on everything you promised, and during those PR events, there's so many promises. Mm -hmm. It's really simple to do. And quite often, I've seen some companies very under the radar start working with, with com out external companies or internally and really create some value and then go back and, and tell it as a case study mm. versus the big announcement. Mm. And which then nothing, yeah. It, it's simple and that way you can actually show an ROI and be able to get a totally different level of approvals, a totally different level of engagement from the outdoor organization. I mean, even what we did in Walmart, it was very under the radar. The CIO brought us in on her like slush fund mm -hmm. budget. But by the time the program ended four months later, she had the CEO, the CMO, the CFO, everybody at the top levels of Walmart and three board members came for that event. And when there she was, was able to show with this budget, this is what we did. Mm -hmm. And and the other, the other point I'm gonna make that you brought up earlier was what do people do wrong? The competition aspect is sometimes a really bad idea. Mm. When we've run internal programs in corporates and all of the teams know that all of them could get support or funding, mm -hmm. they share information. If you have a great programmer on your team or a big data guy and I need one, if we're competing and only one team gets the prize, you're not gonna share that person. Correct. If we're not, and everyone has a chance on their own of being able to be selected and supported, that's the whole point of these programs, to break down the silos and change the culture. Mm -hmm. And when you do it in that way, and everybody's able to actually work together and learn from each other, they become one big team that has lots of different projects. Gotcha. And it's really fantastic and transformative for everyone, because they go back to their departments, knowing people throughout the organization and then can reconnect people in a totally different Create way. Create a new exactly. sort of engagement culture. Definitely. Uh, Malik, your thoughts on this, like, you know, the PR stunts and how you combat this notion uh, with respect to your company, to, with respect Interesting to what word, you do. PR stunt, no, definitely. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you look at everything that we mentioned uh, earlier, between the initiative that we have and every single operation that we, we're doing, between our partnerships and our very close relationship with the VCs, uh, there's no PR stunts here. What we're trying to do here, we're trying to reinvent, reinvent ourselves into becoming a digital service provider. Uh, so it's really a combination of helping the ecosystem, helping us. And if we don't work together, all parties all together, it doesn't work. So for us, a PR stunt is, we it's never not. thought about it, and it's definitely not the case. <laughs> Great, that's good to hear. 30% the, the exception. 
Fine. The exception to the <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, I'm gonna have to close. Any questions? Uh, please raise your hands. No? No? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just ask for final thoughts, uh, Susan and Malik as well. Uh, when it comes, and this is just for the, you know, the startups and the entrepreneurs in the room, when they come and approach you at Zing Kuwait, for instance, for, uh, you know, participating in your programs, what are you looking for? And, uh, you know, what are the kind of qualities that you would like to see uh, when these companies approach you? Okay, so on the first part, what we've done, we've built a framework, an internal framework, and we've, uh, prior, we've been prioritizing what are the fields or the verticals we're gonna invest in. Uh, so the first thing we'll mention, smart cities checked, FinTech checked, uh, digital content checked. What we're looking at now is, is we want, uh, we're looking uh, heavily on, on e-healthcare, e-education, uh, cyber security, uh, and uh, mobile advertising. That's in terms of, of what are the opportunities we're looking at. So whenever there's anything that, that's around that, we're definitely interested. There are other opportunistic stuff that we look at, but the focus now is to fulfill these, these gaps. In terms of the entrepreneurs or the startup themselves, it's only about one thing. We look, we invest, and we like to work with people. It's about the entrepreneur, entrepreneur himself, it's about his team. Anybody can come up with an idea, mm. by implementation, follow up, making it a success. It's all about the person uh, driving that seat. So this is, this is the key element for us. Okay. Uh, Susan, again, uh, last words. Uh, can you talk about the kind of work that you're doing here in the Middle East as much as you can reveal? And uh, you know, why people in this room should uh, take an interest or should, how they can support or maybe participate? in what you're doing in this oh, region. Oh, how lovely, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I've been very lucky to get to do quite a bit in the Middle East at this point. I spent the whole summer in Egypt building out the Innovation Center for the Arab Academy, which is the Arab League University. And we're partnering with ArabNet to do some really cool corporate innovation work throughout the region as well. Mm -hmm. I'm headed back to Egypt to build a program with the Central Bank to transform the way um, SMEs are supported by wow. employees yeah. of the banks to be able to access the hundreds of billions of dollars in loans available to them, which I'm very excited about. Um, and we do a lot of bridge building to help uh, people from all over the world enter the U.S. market mm -hmm. properly. Mm -hmm. I, at the end of the day, I think your comment was so spot on about the people because that's usually the biggest challenge that whenever startups work with us or try to work with corporates that we're supporting, a lot of times people only look at the technology mm -hmm. and they're not understanding that the team is really all, a good team can fix anything wrong with the technology and they're not understanding if the business is going to be able to sustain itself past the approval processes and getting that MSA done. So being able to have the corporates really support aggressively their ability to actually do what they say they want to do, mm -hmm. which is work with startups, mm -hmm. is going to be a gift that we're really excited to get started here. Right. Wish you all the best with that. Thank you. And uh, thank you both for being here today. And I hope uh, this was a good discussion for everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah. you.